What's going on, fiends? It is fucking cold. It's Ohio. There's a polar vortex over us. Pretty sure I saw penguins and possibly signs of guar moving in. So, um, with that being said, let's get into some Darrow Chemical Company. A, a new history lesson for a new year. Tonight on the Midnight Chamber. All right, Darrow Chemical Company, JV Bastard and Ken. Okay, so who all of you who know JV know that when the man does something, he does it 110%. So when I asked him for some information on this record, which is Nightmare on 7th Avenue, this is the first Darrow Chemical Company release. When I asked him for information for this, the man went all out. So, you know, in true spirit of this channel, uh, we're going to get down with the history of this record and really the roots of Darrow, Darrow Chemical Company. And uh, he gave me a lot. So, if you, like, if you want to know more about Darrow, you're about to get it. You're about to get a lot of it. So, we got to go way back. Way back. So, of course, O2, uh, or 0102, Mr. Monster begins falling apart. Uh, I, I, I say that loosely because that's the original, like, band of Mr. Monster. Of course, Jason, you know, RIP, kind of rode that Mr. Monster wave because uh, the Deep Dark EP was released sometime later with Goolsby and um, the other guy with the poofy hair. I can't remember his name. That's a story for a different day. But it, Mr. Monster just had other incarnations. So, But the original band kind of would, fell apart 0102. So, you know, Oh, everybody lived in this house on 7th Avenue in their area of Jersey. And when I say everybody, I'm talking everybody. So I'm going to paraphrase from the notes that uh, I got from Joe because, like I said, there's a lot of information here. And, like, Joe and a bunch of other people... Um, like all lived in this uh, house on 7th Avenue. We're talking his sister, like all the, the guys from Doomsday Prophecy, um, like just a shit ton of people in and out of fucking like all kinds of bands. Around about 02, which pivotal moment and a lot of people will remember this, Michael Graves walks into their practice space because they practiced in the basement. That was kind of like the jam room. And uh, it kind of sent Jason out to California, which if anyone remembers, at one point, Mr. Monster was based out of California for like 30 seconds. And then, of course, after that, there were a lot of other things, like other bands involved. Uh, uh, and then, of course, Quincy who's the drummer and Joe ended up in Graves uh, solo band along with Loki and like that original lineup lasted from like 0203 and that includes Gotham Road because all that happened there too so like 02 to maybe like 06 and then Joe went on tour with Graves from like 06, 07 through like 2010 um, and that was oh, there's a lot of acoustic stuff going on in there um, plus the Marky Ramone Blitzkrieg thing where Joe was teching for Marky as a drum tech so where the hell did Darrow happen in all of this that's the question because there was a lot of touring 
So, like, around 09, Joe gets back from all this craziness, no bands, no nothing, and then, of course, you know, Germs is still living in the house. So, Germs from Mr. Monster. They kind of end up in the basement again. The basement is the, se the seventh house uh, crash pad. And it's nothing, but they go back to jamming. Okay, now, two songs. Uh, Welcome to My Nightmare and Full Moon Rising. Off of this record. Were originally Mr. Monster songs. That They were definitely the more horror-tinged songs on the record. And it's a damn good reason why. They were Mr. Monster tunes. And they were held on for a long time. Uh, Joe even gave... Jason many 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 uh, opportunities to say you know if I record these I'm going to record them you know under a different name so speak up if you want Mr. Monster material and he just he let it go so the jamming happened and it, it was funny when he got back and this jamming started that like the one thing he, he he got from before he ended up with the job washing dishes that he had before any of the touring started that, that's definitely coming back to a big kick in the pants but hey we've all been there and at least he had work in this house what, uh, what would become Darrow and Doomsday pretty much literally started in that basement in the summer of 09 and of course doomsday became like the priority for a while and darrow was kind of like in morphing stages of like occasional band occasional jam thing when people were back and forth keep in mind loki was out on tour with graves half the time and of course like anyone knows the history of mr monster graves gotham road all of that graves germs and loki were in so many bands together and this goes even clear back to uh you know w with mike hideous and empire hideous and spy side 99 and all of that um like all these guys were around because that's the the friend crew i mean anyone who's been around a band everyone kind of gets involved up to a certain point fall 09 darrow played their first show on November 15th. Pretty specific date to get pulled up here, but hey, you find it like, if there's one thing we know about Joe, he's got flyers and memorabilia from ever, just way back. So what prompted the man who's been known to play bass and guitar in various bands to take up the microphone? Well, kind of a necessity. Uh, like whenever they would jam, he would he, he would maybe be on drums, but also singing. It just it like it, the the duty ended up just being right on him, which is kind of hilarious. Uh, I believe he did look for a singer for a while, and anyone who's looked for a singer knows that shit is hard to find. It's hard to find anyone who's got that oomph that you need for singing. Um, not to mention personal taste. Uh, and I, I like his voice because I like what he what he, he brings to, for a lack of better terms, horror. Because Darrow is definitely more of a 90s, like, skate punk band than I would say anything else. Uh, the horror influence is always going to be there. I mean the roots of everyone involved in this, it's always going to be there. Especially if, when you have feelings that you need to get out, That is, this is how most of us in this scene, this uh, genre of music, that's how we get our shit out. You know, if we want to talk about something, it might end up with a meat cleaver or, you know, a hatchet or... You know, talking about a werewolf ripping somebody to pieces. That's how we... It's how we talk about those deeper feelings, you know? So, not to digress any, uh, that would be 
how he ended up taking the microphone up. And really, the, the root of how Darrow was started was because uh, Germs was annoyed that he wasn't in a band, which is hilarious because Germs ended up leaving flat out, period, in, like, in the middle of the recording of Nightmare on 7th Avenue. He was just flat gone. And uh, that kind of sucks, but it is what it is. So while Doomsday Prophecy was really taking off and doing its thing, because that way, like, Doomsday Prophecy is a metal band, and that was, like, the priority. But during all of this, uh, Joe was living in Seventh House with his wife, and, like I said, a bunch of, like, his sister, sister's friends guys from Doomsday Prophecy, like, all these people were, like, in and out of this house, and it was a chaotic mess, and then in the middle of all this bullshit, somewhere along here, Joe gets a divorce, which, um, not, like, it's very poignant to this story, because I don't normally want to bring too much of, like, the artist's personal bullshit into this, but in this case, there was a lot that of that divorce and relationship business that got turned into art put onto this record um and so what what is he he ends up with a, a room at loki's house and it was the first time he had a room by himself for years and years and years and that next thing you know he's you know being a little self-destructive but not really it's you know late 20s, whatever, but also lots of late night guitar sessions, playing and writing and just writing and writing. And so, uh, Nightmare on 7th Avenue comes out in 2012. Prior to that, uh, they, after it was realized that they were going there, like there was a band coalescing and there was going to be like a release, like at least an EP. Uh, the two songs that were uh, from Mr. Monster were quickly, I mean, they were added to the mix of a couple of the new songs and then Teenage Dreams from Mr. Monster was added into that uh, particular mix. So, what you had was uh, anything you want, which was which was obviously a, uh, one of those relationship type songs. Better Dead Than Wed, which was another one of those relationship songs. Full Moon Rise, Welcome to My Nightmare, which were Mr. Monster songs. Teenage Dreams, Mr. Monster song, and then Don't Believe. Uh, I'll get a little more specific on those here in a moment. So, you had all this, uh, you had all this good music that was now made and needed to be recorded. And so, with money that was saved up from uh, marijuana sales, yeah, selling weed to make a record, that is about as punk rock as you can fucking get. Um, They got the money together and boom. Uh, flew into the studio. Hang on, I'm looking for the. Uh, it was Brady Street Recordings. There was a young up and comer local guy who's uh, at the time hadn't even really built his home studio, uh, but he was doing the college thing in Europe, like UK, London, some shit like that. And uh, when he would come back, they would record. And funnily enough, I, I, rem I remember a, a, an interview years ago, right when, when this came out, that Joe said he was really happy when Loki finally got uh, excited about the Darrow record, or like the band. And Loki, oddly, like he just wasn't interested on the first recording session, so he missed it. So they recorded all, the, like Joe recorded all the guitars. 
And then in the middle of this, like right, like somewhere in the middle, like the second recording session, uh, Loki was interested, so he showed up and then did, you know, some of the solos and like layered guitar and stuff. And on top of that, germs had disappeared, so they had to go back and re-record a bunch of his stuff due to, you know, uh, out of tune bass and whatever, like recording issues so they had to go back and fix all that uh but you know over time it could have been done in like two like a week but because of the uh what brady street because of his recording or his school schedule he was able like he, he would have these months where he'd be out of town and so they would give them time to think about things and, uh, you know, come up with ideas. Uh, and there were a lot of vocal takes that were fixed after, you know, had time to mull over the, the scratch mixes and shit like that. And so essentially it just, nothing was rushed and it came out really, really good. Now, uh, a few of these songs were uh, at least better dead than wed was re-recorded later on down the road but we'll get to that when we get to plastic smile which is i like grade a stuff but that's a, a release for a different video um now also keep in mind this was really just uh when the, the just the idea of whb records which is joe's label it was right when that was formed, the whole idea of it. And he'd never run a label. He'd never put a release out like this. So he goes to someone familiar within the uh, the horror punk scene, and that's uh, Travis Boyles and Jake Hades. Travis Boyles being a Bluefield, West Virginia guy, came out of the Blitz Kid camp. Um, I knew him from that. Uh, I don't I, I don't know Jake Hades I don't believe I do at least but either way Joe went to them they decided they were gonna help out um, it also helped that the epidemic worked with Travis so the epidemics uh, quarantine days came out on robot monster which was the name of their label so if anyone who's familiar with horror punk labels you know robot monster did a nice little handful of releases before they closed their doors um, Joe mostly worked with Jake on the, the project with the, the, the layout, the artwork, um, posters, all that stuff. And so he, he didn't have any of the uh, like beginner like screw ups um, on the release. So pretty handy. Um, And on top of, of that, at the same time, they had prepared a live record to be released alongside. And this was recorded, uh, I have it right here, Dara Chemical Company live in Brooklyn. This was released in 2011, which he said these were released in 2012. These both say 2011, whatever. Uh, this uh, is early enough that Germs is actually playing bass on it so this was uh, a couple years down the road but still early on in Darrow's life honestly you can probably I, I bet that shows on YouTube if you really go to look at it The whole, this recording was really, really, really well received, um, which is fucking fantastic. There's nothing better than I like to hear than uh, like someone that comes out of our camp that has something that's well received. Now, this isn't like high up well received. I'd like it to be up there. This is horror punk camp well received, so... Uh, probably just a touch over a thousand 
CDs were uh, sold, plus this, you know, dope 300 cassettes that were pressed up, which are long sold out. Um, the fourth pressing of the, of the record, about half of that was stolen in the great Michael Graves uh, uh, equipment theft in Vegas a few years ago which I believe was the second time that happened. I don't know, I can get a padlock for that shit. And I'm not talking like they told, stole the whole fucking trailer. Like, lifted it right off the tongue of the fucking van and yanked it. It's really fucked up what some people do, especially to, like, any band, un like, 90% of bands are broke as fuck. They might be making some money. I mean, making enough money to tread water, but no one's getting... You know, it's paycheck to paycheck. Or, you know, gig to gig kind of thing. Like, you might have... You'll have a roof over your head, but you're definitely not getting ahead. But you're doing what you love. So, that's kind of the ins and outs of this. And I, I know I normally get to the what the release looks like earlier in the video... But uh, the, the, the history, there's so much history on this record and kind of how it all came together that I wanted to get through that first. And I might have been a little disjointed, but I was, you know, sitting here trying to read my notes. But let's, let's go ahead and break and take a look at these releases because I've got the, uh, the Live in Brooklyn, the actual, and the, the two different versions of... Uh, Nightmare on 7th Avenue that I actually have here and we will be back right after that all right guys check this out Darrow Chemical Company and Nightmare on 7th Avenue so the, when they were uh, recorded this the opening track is kind of like an intro thing and I guess the uh, it was so insane like noisy and whatnot and just like chaotic in that house they tried to recreate the insanity uh as the intro like it got to the point where a couple of the tunes there's the disc right there a couple of the tunes like anything you want and uh maybe don't believe those songs it got to the point where Joe couldn't even write in that house, so they ended up getting finished. Like he might have, he he might have started working on them in that house. The infamous cassette tape, nice black shell, pro printed. You can tell I've been listening to it. Uh, but he ended up finishing everything. This is the download card. Pretty neat stuff. J card's pretty simple. I really like the change of artwork on this. I thought that looks really just nice and classy and tight cover. But no lyrics in this. Probably cheaper that way. But yeah, he ended up writing the the most of the lyrics for, or the most. He finished these songs on uh, in the basement at Loki's house. Good gravy. Okay, so live in Brooklyn. I know there weren't many copies of this pressed. Probably only one pressing of this, too. All black and white. So, the pressing uh, information on this is the first pressing had 300 copies. And this is the first pressing right here. And then the second pressing uh, had new cover art, which was like a broken plate, if I remember correctly. I'll screen cap it in right here. 
and then uh, the the disc tray was completely black, and that was 200 copies. And then the third pressing was another 300 copies, clear disc tray with info on it. And then the fourth pressing was the exact same, and another 200 copies, so 500 with a clear tray. And like I said, uh, half of that fourth pressing was stolen in that Michael Graves uh, equipment ripoff. And then this cassette, 300 copies, advertised as 245. And there you go. That's the information on the record. That is a it's a good looking release for an indie release. And I mean, I support the shit out of some WHB records, like for real. Uh, everything that the fucking labels put out is like top fucking notch. So when this came out, uh, it was I mean, it's not reinventing the fucking wheel here. Uh, but, you know, it's like a new stylish fucking wheel. Like, you know, not like a new design, just like nice and shiny off the production floor. I fucking love this record. It's, uh, like, it's both horror, but it doesn't fall into any of the horror tropes. Which, I'm sure there's somebody out there that's gonna fucking bitch and moan at me. It's not a horror record. What the fuck? Look, there's three songs that were originally intended... Well, one that was a Mr. Monster song. And two that uh, were intended for Mr. Monster. Not to mention the artwork. The people involved with it. So, just go fuck yourself. Like, the what is horror needs... There's no defining boundaries of horror. There's not. There are fucking bands that are horror that are goddamn all over the spectrum. Um, yeah, there's a list of tropes. There's a list of, of like horror punk traditions at this point. But not every band has to fucking do them. You know? And you know what? Did... <laughs> Darrow gets to the woes at a, in a very, very awesome way on the next record. But this one, th this album is, uh, it's kind of, it, 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 this one's deep into the soul. This isn't just like pissed off and saying something. This is, th this is like some internal soul poetry that just needed to be thrown out there. Like a, a, lo a lot of raw emotions that needed to come out. And uh, you can kind of feel it in there, which is, I mean, that, that's what makes some of the better, best releases are when you can just tell that someone really, really, really needed to get some shit off their chest. And that's what you got here. Uh, to be fair, and I, Joe kind of mentioned this, that this live CD never really actually needed to exist, but it's kind of nice. I mean, I like, I, I like, I'm maybe in the minority. I don't know. I love live shows. I love collecting live shows. I'm a live bootleg whore. I, I love live boots. And maybe that's from loving live shows and then also living in ass end Ohio where I have to travel at least an hour to get to anything that remotely involves a live show. My town used to have live shows, not anymore. We haven't had a, a decent live concert in this town in a while. Eight years? Five years? Five years? I think the la last time my one of my bands played here was maybe five, four or five years ago. Been too fucking long is what it has. Point being is I love live shows. So I don't mind this. I like having live shows. Some people fucking hate live shows. Um, it's really a taste thing. And, uh, it is what it is. I like it. Uh, I was thrilled when this fucking came out, though, because I like Joe's singing. I like, like, it, it, everyone involved are fucking awesome musicians. Um, I remember there being a big buzz about this when it, when, like, it was, we were churning up to this record coming out like there was a big buzz about it and 
I mean, you gotta think, like, a year later was the uh, Blitz Kid final tour, which Joe played guitar on. So we had this big hype coming up through, from, like, Blitz Kid's apparitional coming out, and then a whole lot of craziness in there. And then Joe, you know, JV getting this fucking band together. And them started, they started playing out and playing with um, just like all the horror punk family and then dropping this EP. And it was solid as fuck. Solid as all hell. And uh, like I said, it's not reinventing the wheel, but it's also, it's really, really good. And the one thing I always liked about this band is they, they're they kind of nostalgic, but it's not a nostalgia act. Because, like with Plastic Smile, for example, they, uh, they wanted to uh, bring any of us back to their, like, 90s skate punk, like... Fat Records bands like Propagandy and no, uh, no Use for a Name and like all that stuff. They wanted to take us back there, which is cool. Um, this is just like the the step right before that, and uh, it's certainly a lot more emotional than maybe Plastic Smile, which th that t takes nothing away from Plastic Smile, which I will get to, as I said later but uh this one seems cathartic as fuck and i mean there's not really a whole lot more to say about it than that um i look forward to like deep history episodes such as this um because in like oh nine oh ten was probably the last gasp of the big horror scene um we're still here we're still bumping but everything is on like tiny tiny like unless Goolsby's got a new record coming out or um man like I, I don't see people getting hyped for Graves records Cancer Slug uh, whenever Alex drops a fucking record everyone loses their fucking mind um I'm thinking this year is going to be amazing for horror uh jv really wants uh it's the 10 year anniversary of this record this year so this fall will be 10 years on the nose he wants this to be the first whb vinyl to come out uh i can we can hope that happens it probably will that man when that man gets you know, like his mind set on something, he will accomplish the shit out of it. Um, I know there are other things from other people happening, but this is going to be a year for WHB, probably the second half of the year. Uh, things are kind of moving around right now. So we can look forward to hopefully seeing Darrow popping back out and maybe doing, doing some shows. Uh, because I haven't gotten to see Darrow live since 2013. Probably Dece December 2013, I think, would be the uh, last time I saw Darrow. I believe that was when it was. That was, if anyone remembers the Natural Born Grillers tour, that was a fucking killer time. So, uh, yeah, there we have it. That, in a nutshell, is going to be Darrow Chemical Company. And I've been rambling way too fucking long. Um, but, yeah. They don't have any copies of this physical, so uh, there will probably be represses soon. So when that pops out, get it. It'll be awesome. And you know what? I'm going to catch you guys next time on the Midnight Chamber.